Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom, and today I am talking to someone who's actually been on the show before. Now, the interesting thing about this, when he first came on, he had just gone into business for himself. He had just decided to quit his job and become an artist full time. And what's great is, is like a year later, we get to see what happened, how that played out, what changed. He actually took some courses, uh, business courses, one of them actually being the Shopify business course, because apparently their headquarters are right by where he lives. He's from Canada, so they're right by where he lives. And he went and took their business course there. And he talks about how at first he didn't really, they were telling him he should try these things. And he's like, no, I want to do things this way. And then later on kind of adapted to it. I even kind of, uh, I, I was kind of talking to him about how it's interesting that he decided to stick it to his guns and do things the way he was. And he's like, no, actually now I'm kind of pivoting. I'm doing something else. So he, uh, he kind of talks about how selling his own artwork takes time, takes uh, making the product itself is like, you can only do one at a time. So what can he, we, we get into all that kind of stuff. It's, it's just a, it, when he also talked to me last time, he was talking about the idea of a game that he had because he likes gaming. He likes tabletop games. So he had an idea for a game called Honey Bomb. And since then, he actually created a Kickstarter for it. And the game is in the process of being made. And he's learned more about business through mass production, through making a game. How do you prepare it? How to make the, the packaging? Don't forget to check out Sean Chappell's site, which for his artwork, you go to redfracture.com. Or for his games, you go to ramstargames.com. Here's today's episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I am Sean Chapel. I'm an independent artist working on board games. So you've been on the show before. So just for people who haven't yes. uh, heard that episode yet, where are you located, first of all? Cambridge, Ontario. Not too far. I'm about eight eight or nine hours from where you are. Really? Oh, I think we figured that out last time, too. Is like, yeah, it's like just a day's drive and we get just up about, there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Fun. And now you actually had left your job to pursue art full time. Yes. Yeah. That was a year ago, actually. Just about a year ago now. Yeah. No, uh, it was well, just over, actually. Sorry, it was uh, November 1st, uh, 2019. Really? Okay. Yep. So we're, wow. Okay. Well, while we're recording this, it's close to that day. It's, by the time this yeah. comes out, it'll be past that day. But so how has it been going, first of all? I, this is the best part. While I've had you on before and you've told me what you do, now we can talk about like what your experiences have been. So how has it been going, uh, going into business for yourself full time as an artist? Uh, it's been it's been uh, interesting, shall I say? I'll put it that way. It's been good and bad in okay. a couple of unique and interesting ways. Um, when I I first jumped out, um, I was I was full of piss and vinegar, and I was gonna dominate the world and take everything over and fine art everything, and and it was gonna be this great big, amazing stellar smash hit kind of thing. And I started running into walls pretty quickly with that. Um, that idea. I, I did a business course through a local uh, business group uh, it, just down the street here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was all about, you know, writing a business plan, finding your um, your clients, what did they look like, where are you going to find them, right. uh, what's your marketing plan, so on and so forth. So it was a pretty comprehensive program which kind of ran through all the things you might need to know to run a business, mm -hmm. regardless of what it was. Uh, that you want to do all kinds of different people in this program so it, it was really open for everybody but um i started running up against actual attitudes inside the program itself from the people who were running it when i told them i was an artist yeah and that i wanted to do art full-time for a living i started running into sort of generalized attitudes of artists don't make money uh, and that they constantly wanted to try to turn me in a different direction and sort of saying, instead of doing this, why don't we take what you're doing and kind of go with this direction instead? Mm -hmm. 
And that really wasn't what I wanted. And what I really wanted was their help saying, okay, so you want to do this? Let's figure out how to do this. So in, uh, it sounds like they were trying to, instead of helping you market your work, they were trying to make your work more marketable? Yeah, more or less. Sort of finding a, a different avenue of attack for what I did. Yeah. And looking back on it after being self-employed for a year, it was probably the actual right decision. It was probably the, the wisest decision. What do you mean? What um, was? Well, it, it, changing the focus of my work. Changing okay. uh, from from fine art itself to another uh, another direction in general. And so uh, ultimately over the year, uh, I've done a lot of stuff. Like, <laughs> a lot of stuff over the year. I'm, I'm pretty self-motivated. Yeah. So I've done dozens of artworks and I've sold actually uh, quite a few artworks to to all the artists out there who are, are listening to this and you know sold a couple of pieces this year and you made a couple thousand dollars and certain you know that sort of thing I'm way past that um, you know I've done a couple dozen different pieces have sold uh, through my website and I've made somewhere in the range of about twenty thousand dollars this year cool and so that's not that's not terrible uh, as an income figure as it were and for a guy who never made very much money as an artist in general, it's pretty good, you know, actually taking the leap and running my own business and being here, doing the work, running the website, talking to people, doing the email, all the rest of it. It does, it does work to a degree. It helps to get you going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But I've also had a lot of luck this year in that some of the pieces that I did five years ago happened to find the right person this year. Yeah. So I did an album cover for a group called Goblin. I may have mentioned this in our past talk. I remember um, that. Yeah. A front a front and the back cover and they sold to a super fan in Italy. Uh, and he dropped a ton of money on them because huh. I put a, a gigantic price tag on them because I thought they would never sell and they did. <laughs> and we had we had a huge mailing snafu trying to get them to Italy without having them get hung up on the border and super fees and importation well, taxes. How big and what type of uh, format was it in? Like, was it a canvas or was it a print? Like what, how, as far as shipping it? Yeah, they were uh, two 16 inch square canvases. Okay. So the package itself wasn't much bigger than that. I, I usually give a couple inches on all the way around and then a couple inches top and bottom. So, yeah, you know, not a huge package. But I sent it through Canada Post, through ground mail, and for those who aren't, aren't uh, able to see me, I'm doing air quotes, uh, because it's going to Italy, I figured it was going to go on a plane. Yeah. But they still have sort of a snail mail service where it goes on a boat. So that was the cheapest, and that's how it went. So it sat in Canada in a Montreal holding center for about 11 weeks. Hmm. So I, I sent this thing out in July, and I don't think he got it until end of September, something like that. It took forever yeah. for it to, to get there. June, it, it was July, August, September. It took, it took months, and I couldn't believe it. And I was back and forth with this guy just apologizing mm -hmm. that I had no idea that they still did that, that they actually ship things. They put mail on boats, and they ship it. It's the cheapest way to do it, but it takes the longest. Right. So, but yeah, so I've had a lot of, a lot of that kind of weird synergy happening uh -huh. in my year. Um, but overall I haven't really found my market. I haven't been able to tap into a consistent source of revenue doing fine art, uh, selling paintings, one of a kind fine art imagery. It just, I haven't found the right client group. To, to keep pushing it. I know that we did kind of talk about, you were, you were just starting two different courses the last time I talked to you. When you went into this, you, which I thought was fascinating because um, a lot of the time, myself included, it's like, I will do that. I'll get to it. I'll do that marketing course eventually. I really should, you know, and I still haven't. Uh, you know that, that sort of, and you you did too. You did one, the local one that you're talking about, and you also did the Shopify course because you have a Shopify okay. store, and you took the course that they actually offer when you sign up. Everybody oh, yeah. gets it, and I don't know how many people take it, and you actually took it. Now, what you're talking about, and we had discussed this when you first started. Like, I know marketing, and the reason I don't take it is because I worked in marketing for years, so I'm right. like, I know what I'm doing. 
I still could. It's always nice to get some outside opinion or at least even collaborate with anyone. But you're talking about uh, some people would ca uh, call it building an avatar or, um, you know, when you're saying find your perfect shopper. Like if you were to invent a person that you think right. would be who you're like someone when you're writing your emails or doing a video or uh, even just writing a blog about you would pretend that you're talking directly to that person who right. knows it perfectly. So what up to that point, what was the avatar that and I'm, it changes all the time? And I know it does. And that's because you never know. Of course, you're going to shoot for the stars and everybody loves you at first. And then you got to bring it down. So what was the avatar and what has it changed? Or at least your perfect marketing uh, person, who was it? And how would you explain it? Well, um, to be honest with you, I never really put my, my finger on it. it. It changed a lot. I changed my style and my approach quite a bit mm -hmm. to try to find where my work was going to land properly, you know, and who it was going to land with. Uh, so it was, you know, I had a, a certain age bracket. It would be men and women within sort of, you know, 25 to 45 years. They work in a job that gives them anywhere between 50 to, say, $100,000 a year. They love creative things, so they go out to concerts and they go out to art galleries, and they're involved with you know culture in some way. Perhaps their their work is in uh, video or television or something like that. You know, they have a creative mm -hmm. pursuit that they do, um, so on and so forth. I went down all these lists, and you you write out all the demographics and you write out all the all the hobbies and how many. I didn't get quite as far as you know, uh, putting them in a house and how many kids do they have and do, are they dog people or are they right. cat people, so on and so forth, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I went through that and kind of a lot of them ended up looking quite a bit like me. You know, I, mm -hmm. I love this stuff and I'm into, you know, horror films and I like uh, creative board games and I like uh, all kinds of, you know, bright colors and different things like this. So I was modeling quite a bit of my audience on myself and I still haven't really been able to tap into finding those people where they are and um, and it has I, I've been lucky in one respect that uh, not only did I have that opportunity to sell those two pieces to that gentleman in Italy yeah but I've got one super fan in Quebec which is the province just oh. above us and uh, he's purchased two dozen pieces of mine over the year do you know how we found you i have no i i think i met him at the montreal comic-con oh okay uh like five years ago again five or six years ago there was one gentleman who kept coming back to the table that i had there and picking up small pieces off my table and he bought about six six of my small um mixed media pieces really and yeah, this gentleman, he's, uh, he's purchased he, like consistently every month or every other month, he'll drop a couple thousand or even $3,000 on four or five, six pieces of mine. And, uh, I ship them out and away they go. And he's been, he's really been like my angel investor this year Yeah. without his assistance, without his, his fandom, I would be destitute at the moment. I'd be having serious money problems. Yeah. <laughs> right. But yeah, if I had four of him. I'd be fine. I, I'd be working in my basement every day, painting new stuff and, and not worrying about it. I'd be trying to make as much stuff to ship out as possible. Uh -huh. But uh, he's been the only one that I've really been able to grab a hold of and see consistent uh, sales through. And um, yeah, it's sort of, it's been one of those, it's been one of those years. It's kind of good and bad. I've got a great super fan, but I've only got one. Yeah. You know, uh, and I've been able to sell some of this. Stuff. Well, some of us don't have any, mister. <laughs> I know. I know. And, and it's fine. It, you know, and, I mean, I'm not, I'm not knocking it. Don't I know you're me. not. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's tough. It's tough. And of course, you know, the, the current climate with COVID-19 and everything getting shut and so on and so forth really hasn't helped. Yeah. So I was really, uh, the whole Shopify thing that you mentioned, I was really into that at the beginning of the year. I was meeting with a lot of people from that from that program, and we were actually setting up a storefront. We had been given a, a storefront in a local mall for six months. They were going to give it to us for for us uh, rent free, as long as we set up a whole sh crew of Shopify people inside the store to sell oh. and to bring new clients to the mall. 
Is there so, like a Shopify located where you live or something like that? Like one of their headquarters, is it there? Because yeah. I, okay, there is. I was going to say, because when I talked to you last time, it seemed like you had a lot more access to it than people that I've known in the past that have used Shopify. Yeah, so. I'm lucky in the fact that there's one in Waterloo, which is just up the street from us. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of stuff right here. I mean, Cambridge, where I'm at, is is nicely located in between a lot of big major cities. And then just on our doorstep uh, in Waterloo is a huge tech hub and business hub. There's all kinds of stuff going on there all the time. Okay. And, uh, you know, yeah, Shopify is part of that. So we had all this stuff planned. You know, we were going to open up the storefront, and I'd be able to market my artwork there, and 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 any all these other merchants were going to be there. And then COVID nineteen came along. That got stopped. All the shops got shut because everything got shut down. Yeah. And we haven't looked at it since because we haven't been able to. You know, we can't. We can't do it. Um, and then, of course, that led to everything else that I had in the fire, all the open, sh all the art shows, all the live events, uh, even marketing, some marketing that I had in other events that were going to go on, but I wasn't going to be there. That got canceled. Everything done. Right. <laughs> come, come the end of March, everything was shut. Everything was shuttered. It was, uh, it, I'd be really curious to see where I'd be right now if all of that had gone through. You know? Yeah. Well, how would you adjust it? So that happens, of course, and it's horrible. And we've all experienced it and we've all yeah. then gone, eventually gone, yes, we do have to switch. So what did you do to adjust to that? A lot of it became, of course, um, the only avenue of tech then is, of course, to go digital and to go online as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, I, I did that. I sort of shifted my focus away from physical events to more either online events of which I haven't really had a lot of opportunity to get involved with yet. Or um, it was, you know, re retooling my website and making it more user-friendly and then putting together proper newsletters and all kinds of marketing materials and things of that nature. So it was getting diving deeper into my website and support for it and the newsletter that would hopefully grow my, my following and so on and so forth. So that's that's where I focused. Not only that, but because I had all this time, because I wasn't setting up a Shopify uh, storefront or all this other stuff, I just started producing a lot of artwork. Yeah. Um, the, the piece behind me there that you can see, that one I I did um, over the course of about three weeks. Okay. I put that one together, and it ended up actually in a gallery in Toronto. Oh. So we gave that one gave that a try. Um, it, you know, for all the doors that shut. I started looking for other opportunities. So I hadn't really thought about approaching galleries, uh, but I, well, an opportunity fell in my lap and I thought, why not? Give it a try. Yeah. See what you like and see if it works. And how did you discover that this gallery had an opening or how did you submit to them? Oh, uh, well, it was a, a mutual friend, actually. Uh, somebody I went oh. to school with had a piece in a show just before COVID-19 shut everything down. Mm-hmm. So I ended up going to the opening, seeing him, meeting the gallery owner, and then through their website, and um, I, I found out that they do portfolio reviews. So I thought I would get a critical eye on what I was producing and see what they had to say about it, you know, just to get that opinion. Yeah. And in the end, it led to an opportunity to show a piece in the gallery, just it's sort of like a group show where they would bring in a whole round of new artists and see... Who saluted essentially? Who so, saluted? Yeah, like which? Who who likes which piece? Oh, okay. So, you know. <laughs> I'm like, do they line people up in a row and like that's how they vote for them? People salute. It's like yay or nay. Um, no, no, that'd be cool though. We should, would we be. Could try that, well, that was what I pictured in my head when you said it. Like instantly, in the brief second you said that, I had this whole thing that popped through my head like it was some weird flash, like in Family Guy. Um, right. <laughs> like suddenly I switched scenes. Um, so you, you did that. And then the other thing too, is I do like the fact that even with people saying, and when you were doing the marketing thing and trying to find the avatar that you had, it seemed like people were saying, well, this is successful. So go do that. And you have not, uh, waned from doing the type of stuff that you still like to do the type of work that you like to put out, which is very no. surreal. Well, and I, I, I have, enjoy that. I have changed. I have changed my direction. 
I think after after about a year now, it, well, it has been a year, um, I'm really kind of coming to a bit of a realization around art, fine art specifically. Okay. Uh, and if you if you really want to, well, for me, I'm finding that my work because of how uniquely creative it is, uh, it's in a very small bubble, and trying to find people to purchase it at a price that I can actually survive on is tough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I've had a lot of, uh, like the piece behind me here, um, I wanted to market that at 25000 in the gallery in Toronto. Because galleries take 50% commission on everything that they sell, mm. uh, I needed to at least make out $10,000 for my time and effort and everything that went into making the piece so that I had, uh, you know, operating capital so I could keep going, essentially. And they came back and told me, well, a piece of this size in our gallery sells for $6,000. And if we were to split that and then I took all my costs out of it, I would have been making somewhere in the range of about $7 an hour. So ultimately, that, as much fun as it was to be in the gallery and to do the work and to really push myself to produce something really unique and interesting, there wasn't a lot of money in that direction. Yeah. What? Yes, they could sell it, but they couldn't sell it for enough to keep me in business. I was going to not make any money, and I wasn't willing to sell it for that price. So we actually ended up settling on twelve, twelve thousand dollars. Okay. Which is double what they usually sell it for, but six thousand at least would have paid me a living wage. Uh, and in the end, she did have a, she had a nibble, and uh, somebody was interested in buying it. And she did have to drop the price a little bit to try to make it a bit more enticing. Mm -hmm. But in the end, they decided not to buy it. So I get to have it now. I get to hang it right. on my wall. I was going to say, clearly, the story ends with it's behind you right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Not ideal, but it happens. Um, well, and that, you know, that makes me wonder, too. I mean, I was specifically thinking of that. Like you said, it took you three weeks to do it. And yeah. you're selling it. And it's like, that's the thing is during that time period. And you are, you said you were producing more art, but like still three weeks in putting out one piece of work. That's the part that always gets me. Whereas do you also do things like you sell cheaper versions as prints and all that kind of stuff on your, your store? I know you used to do t-shirts. I don't know if you're still doing those to this day or if you just have the ones that you did before. Uh, yes and no. Again, I, I, it's, it's been one of those sort of like good bad type things yeah. so i've been producing been producing the work and and i i think it's a higher quality of what i've been able to do mm -hmm. um but i haven't been able to find the sales channels to to sell it uh, and the same thing with my t-shirts and my prints and things like that it's all on my website it's all there it's mm -hmm. all ready for people and people look at it but people aren't buying it so i've been having a hard time selling what i do to the public even at a even at a low price point um, I'm finding that the work is not resonating with people. So um, that's been a, a, a bit of a, a hard pill to swallow. Uh, my my work with the gallery, which was mo the most recent thing that I did, uh, that was back in August, kind of got my wheels spinning. And it made me sort of think that after all that effort, if there's still no money, even in a commercial gallery setting, for me to do this work and I'm having difficulties selling it myself and finding the right people to buy it. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. What are we doing here? You know, um, you can sort of keep smacking your head against that wall. And I think some people end up breaking through it and you do find what you're looking for. When I started running down in my head, sort of the list of things that I could do in order to change my, my avenue of attack, essentially. Like what? Well, things like moving essentially. So leaving Cambridge and going to somewhere more art focused. Oh, that being like New York city, like going, going somewhere where the movers and shakers are and you can go to the gallery openings and you can shake people's hands and you can meet Eventually. people and get to know. Right. <laughs> it, it, it's the same idea of like, if you want to be a Hollywood, if you want to be an actor, you go to Hollywood, you go to where they make the movies, you know, so I've thought about that kind of idea. Mm -hmm. um, I've also thought about, you know, completely reskinning what I do. And the work that you see here, um, that's for me. I do that for me. But then I come, I'm, I'm going to create something else 
a different style of artwork which will be more commercially feasible. Um, so I, I did uh, the artwork for that the board game that uh, we talked about last time. Which we're going to get to because I still want to find out about that because that's also one of the things you did. <laughs> well, that's 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 where I'm heading now. That's that's right. my new direction. But we'll get there. Yeah. Um, but in that in the game in the um, in the artwork, I put together flowers and fireworks as as a visual image inside of the game. And I thought about that. I thought just take those images, put fireworks and flowers together, uh, gigantic, big paintings. You know, do it loose, do it rough, make it fast. Yeah. And throw. You know, people like flowers. People like colorful things. Let's work with that and try to make it fast, inexpensive, and appealing. Go. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and don't worry about whether or not it necessarily meets your artistic ideal. It, it's, you know, it's, I'm, I put my soul on a canvas and I got crickets. So it's, you know, it's sort of right. from the financial side of things, if you want to make money, you have to buy something that people want. And over the last year, barring the one gentleman from Quebec and that other gentleman from Italy, it's been, it's been tough trying to find people who are really engaging with my work. So that's the other, the other avenue of attacks. You change, you change your, you change your output, whatever, whatever that is. If that thing's not working, we need to mm -hmm. rethink it. Um, Can I ask something too, though? Uh, while you have your website where you put everything and you say you're getting people to go there, which of course is always the best thing because you always want people to come to the central place. But like what other places are you putting it besides like say on Facebook or social media? Are you posting your stuff to like say Fine Art America or are you posting your stuff to like say eBay? Like places where people actually go look for artwork? Have you ever thought about doing stuff I, like that? I have investigated some of those places. Okay. Um, and I've read a lot of articles about them and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, like there's there's Saatchi Fine Art. Right. Yep. And, and yeah, uh, you know, Fine Art America and lots of other places where you can post. Uh, but most people, most of what I, uh, the advice that I've been reading was don't bother. It's so saturated. Nobody will find you. Okay. You know, so it's, you can do it, but the chances of getting, you know, finding the, the perfect client is pretty tough. Yeah. Well, and the only reason I bring it up is because the one thing that those sites do have, especially, and this is why I added that to it, like eBay, like the other day I went to eBay. Now, well, cause I sell on eBay tons, but the other thing right. too, is I still search for it. Uh, search for things on it. And I was looking for illustrations or an example of an illustration or something like that and found out that there's like a whole movie poster section. But when I looked at it closely, it was people doing fan posters. It was people posting like, this is my interpretation of what the Joker poster should have been, or this is, you know, like, and they were all like very, uh, they were all Ill more like comic based and like rock based and stuff like that. And, right. uh, and surreal. And the funny thing is, is now after I looked at that page one day, I didn't even really click on some, I get emails like 10 times a day about like these new posters, like they do the marketing for you. You know what I mean? Like they're right. built to bring people back to their site. And that's why I wonder, like, have you ever thought about trying that? Like that one, you, you can do an eBay free account. You get like what, 10 postings or something like that. And you can put those up there. It'd just be interesting that if people actually did, people are there to search for specific things because they go when people go i want something well, let's see if there's a cheap one on ebay people know what that is and then ebay wants people to come back to their site and they do all the marketing for you so right. I'm, I'm curious to see what that would be like i mean if you put like one or two of your things up there just an experiment like even like get back to me and go like yeah nothing happened and i'd be like okay well i'm an idiot so you know. <laughs> no it's a great idea so why that, not try it yeah you know? and and mainly um, it's because they market for you and that's why i bring it up um so just another suggestion yeah that's basically where I'm at when it comes to my my work right now is is marketing. I'm just I have a ton of it. I've got a lot of it to you know. I'm, I'm not even actually really producing any new physical works right now. Right. Um, I've I've moved on to an iPad and I'm working with. I saw digital. that recently. It was fantastic. Yeah. You're like it was almost there was only a slight thing that made me go, oh, that's the digital one, and this is his actual airbrush artwork. Like you were mastering that iPad. Tell me more about that. <laughs> Yeah, it's, well, it, it's one of those things. Um, after sort of this last year of, of doing the fine art thing and really pushing at it and not quite seeing the results that I want and not seeing those necessary, this, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, necessarily sort of future opportunities 
cropping up, you know, mm -hmm. sort of saying, oh, yeah, okay, in three months I can do that, in six months I can do that. It's all basically nothing at the moment. Um, I'm sort of, I'm changing my focus now with, with the artwork. And we had talked last time about our board game, which is called Honey Bomb. Yeah. It's a, well, it's not a board game, sorry. It's a tabletop game. But uh, similar to you know, it's in the it's in that genre. And um, when I did the artwork for that, it was all physical. It was all done with airbrush and regular paint brushes. And we had to do some changes. And the changes were really painful because I had to paint things out and repaint them, and it's a pain in the butt. So I wanted to pick up an iPad because we still we're still working on that. Um, COVID nineteen kicked the legs out from underneath that as well from us. Right. And we were going to kickstart it this November, but we got some feedback about our uh, our Kickstarter page and our numbers when it came to what we were trying to sell. And we decided to postpone it until spring until we can kind of retool our offer, essentially. So we had the game and we had the shipping, but it would have been too expensive for people to back properly. Uh, everybody, all the experts that we were throwing this in front of were saying, rethink the numbers and come back at it with a better plan because this is not going to fly. People won't back this. Yeah. So we decided to take that off, off the market. We're going to go back at it in the spring, but I was um, curious why you guys canceled it and, and you had just uh, posted that recently that you, that it's yeah. on or that it's canceled until uh, 2021. So it was it, basically, it wasn't what, so I guess I don't get it. They're saying that it wasn't sustainable or it wasn't, Ultimately, cover the, the cost or what? What they were saying is that the the offer that we were making wasn't enticing enough. People were probably going to look at what we were offering, how much we were asking for it, and adding the shipping on top and saying that's too much. I won't pay for that. Okay. Right. So we're looking at making the game a little less expensive. So we're re, re, repackaging it uh, with the manufacturer, kind of organizing that, and we're now looking into a. Um, a logistics center to actually do our shipping for us. We were going to do it all ourselves. We were going to use Canada Post in our in our um, account with them, but other groups get better deals and they can do it with inside of the country that you're selling to. Mm. So all of our American customers would actually get them from within inside of America. The shipment would go straight to their logistics center and it would go from there. And so you're paying for shipping from within inside of America, not from within inside, uh, not from outside. So the shipping drops drastically. And then would this be a sort of place where you would just send them supplies and it would sit in a warehouse and then get shipped out? But I guess I'm curious as to, or are they getting manufactured there? I, it, what's the process no, that no. ultimately it's um, after, after the Kickstarter, we know how many we need. We put that order into our manufacturer. Gotcha. Okay. who's in China, and then they ship them directly to the logistics center in America. Gotcha. Okay. Right. And then these groups, they actually have hubs around the world. So they have one in Europe. They have one in Asia. They have one in the South Pacific, that okay. kind of idea. So your shipment might go in four directions. And then they can offer really great shipping from within inside of Europe because your games are there now. They're not coming from Canada. So that, that was sort of the – that's – the plan that people threw at us and said, try this because people won't back what you're, what you're selling now. Who are the people that were helping you with that? Uh, that, that was actually um, a, a couple of different Facebook groups. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Yeah. There's um, a couple of different Kickstarter advice groups that are on Facebook. They're free to join and mm. they were awesome. I actually met a bunch of different people uh, who have had all kinds of uh, Kickstarter experience and great fundraising uh, opportunities and um, this one gentleman out of California who I was chatting to his name is Gary he was integral to a game called rival restaurants and hmm. their first Kickstarter made 350,000 and their second one uh, which was a reprise of the game with an expansion broke 500,000 something like that so between the two Kickstarters they made close to a million dollars so I actually reached out to him and he chatted to me. He talked to me just like we are here mm -hmm. um, for a couple of hours. And he sort of went through our campaign. He's like looking at this, looking at that. And he was actually their numbers man. He was the guy who told me all about the logistics companies, how to get your shipping down, other fees to think about. What about wow. this? 
you know, and he was the exact right guy to reach out and talk to, and he was really open and agreeable to do it and gave me a couple hours of his time, which is fantastic. Yeah. And after chatting with him, I was just, I was sold. I was like, yeah, we're not ready. <laughs> and it's, it's better to, you know, like fly by that, that target and come back around at it again mm -hmm. and, and retool it for the spring. And I think we'll have a much better opportunity to, uh, to make it successful. It's funny, the last time we spoke, that was just an idea that you had come up with and you were starting to go forward with it. You were building artwork and everything. And now we're talking about the end result, but like, what about creating the game itself? Like, how were you testing it out? How were you getting it ready? Like, how do you know it works? Like, how does that part work out? Well, we had we had some opportunities before COVID-19 shut everything down mm -hmm. to actually get out into play spaces and show it to people. So we took it to a couple of game stores. We took it to a couple of gaming cafes. Uh, our local library has a game night, so we took it there oh. as well. Uh, and we did have, I, I almost had a tournament set up, actually, in a small town called Rockton, which is not far from us. They That's have cool. a whole community of gamers there, and they, they play in like a Quonset hut. They have this gigantic space where they all come together and play. And I think they have about 30 players or 30, 30 members. Okay. So we could have literally run a tournament. We had enough packages of honey bomb on hand to do a to do a tournament. So I was really looking forward to that because it would have been thirty people's opinions of all ages, of all types of gameplay experience playing our game. It would have been great, a really great night uh, to learn some things. It's, you know, is it a good game? Is it you know what mechanics work? What don't? How can we make it better? And unfortunately, it got canceled too. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we've done, uh, because we can't meet people in person, we can't go to the conventions and show them our prototype, we can't do any play testing of that sort, we've actually made it free. So what we've done is we've, we've made a print and play edition oh, that okay. you can download off our website. Um, if people want to get a copy of it, they can go to ramstargames.com and get a copy of Honey Bomb. And they can print it off at home. Uh, it's formatted to print double-sided, just like our tiles are double-sided, and all you have to do is cut it out and give it a shot, you know? <laughs> and so now our outreach is, is that. We're trying to put it in people's hands in another way so that they can try it out in the comfort of their own home uh, with their kids, their families, whoever, and, uh, and give it a shot and then tell us what they think about it. You know, you know, how did it play for you? Did you like this? Did you like, you know, what was, what can we change? How can we make it better? That also seems very time intensive or was that, are you just using say the prototype setup that you had already that you were using or the printout thing? Like you had to go and then create a printout game. That's not just like, Oh, we built a website and instantly the game appeared there. No. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work yeah. it is. to anybody who wants to run their own business. Don't think it's going to be all, you know, wine and roses. It really is. It's, it's a lot of work. It's, you know, nose to the grindstone. I, I usually work right. anywhere from eight to 10 hours or 12 hours every day. I'm, I'm, but because I'm being creative, I don't see it as work. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm playing, for me, it's play, but it's it's still, you know, the end goal is is business related. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's um, it it wasn't too hard to actually make a print and play. It was it was more uh, setting up, taking our artwork and setting it up inside of a document that I could turn into a PDF. Okay. So yeah, that wasn't that wasn't too intensive. That wasn't too bad. And how is the uh, how has it been going so far? I mean, with that and what you've learned, and you're waiting like, what is the process? What what comes next? How are you setting it up for next year? Like, what's changed, or what is going to change? Well, uh, right now, so what we're what we're doing is we're working with the manufacturer in China to repackage our uh, our original package for Honey Bomb was too big, too full of air, and shipping useless cardboard essentially. Oh, so, okay. I had one idea in my head of how to put it together, and Gary who chatted with me, gave me other ideas and sort of said, try this instead. You know, I told him how big the game really was. And he's like, your box is way too big. You're putting it in, you know, it's, it's pushing your shipping to the next tier because of the size of it. And are you designing the box, like the, the actual package itself, or do you have somebody that's doing that for you? Uh, we're going to do it ourselves. Uh, okay. As long as we have the dimensions, we're good. Okay. 
the, the manufacturer will actually set up a guide for us, um, a, a template that we can populate hmm. with our with our own design, uh, and it's um it's it's quite um it's quite well put together. So when you get that, it'll show you the the proper print area, your your bleed area, and your margins and all the rest of it. And this you know you have to make sure that you hit you, you know give yourself room for for printing errors and all the rest of it. Um, yeah. So it's all it's all very well organized, and and we're yeah we're savvy enough we're tech savvy enough to to do it ourselves. Well, that's good. Yeah, because so, that's yeah. what I realized is as you when I open a game, you know, it's got like the little compartment for the cards and the little box for the you know and the board has to fit in there. And it never occurred to me like again, it's one of those things where it's like it just happens. No, it has to be designed somewhere. <laughs> Duh. Yeah. Which is another it's thing just, that well, takes up your time. I mean, how are you managing this and? Meanwhile, working on a three-week-long project that you're painting type yeah. stuff, you know? <laughs> well, truth, truthfully, the truth of it is one has to win out. Uh, I've been trying to do two things at once, and one has to win out. So okay. at the moment, the, the iPad that I picked up recently is all about learning how to do things digitally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the skill set that I already have for airbrushing and art in general has really translated very easily to, to the iPad. I understand form and function, and I've used Photoshop enough to understand layers and this, that, and the other thing. So switching over to digital has not been too tough. As you as you said, you saw my pieces, and you're like, that looks just like his art. It does. And, yeah. yeah, and it's it's really um, user-friendly for me. I love it. I think it's, I think it's really... Uh, going to be good for me to go in that direction. Uh, and the whole idea behind it is, is basically is to start learning digital enough to make our next game. So for me, the fine art side of what I was doing uh, over like a year ago, that I started a year ago, I'm kind of bringing that to a close, to a degree. So I will still be doing fine art when the bug bites me, of course, I need to pick up a, a you know a pencil and get going on something. But I probably will be dialing back, actually physically creating art and going more into the digital side of things and learning how to bend what I do to another product line, to another process. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I've realized, like we're we're avid gamers as well. We play a lot of a lot of games, and we're into the really the more creative side of of gaming, so all the stuff that's big imagination, you know, it's it's Cthulhu taking over the world. It's it's how did the ghost die? Here's your weird imaginary cards to try to figure it out. It's it's all the Disney games. It's all these escape rooms and other things. We like that engagement, um, and I'm finding that my artwork fits inside of those games. Yeah, like that the bizarreness and the weirdness that I generally produce that I've been trying to sell on as fine art is going to be a huge hit inside of board gaming because anything goes in board gaming. It doesn't really matter as long as it's fun. People love it. And you know, the, the more creative the artwork, people love that too. If you really put your, you know, your effort into it, it comes back. People look at it and go, wow, what a great game. I really love the way this looks. And people have, constantly complimented the artwork for Honey Bomb. So I'm sort of putting two and two together, and what I really want to do is now start moving completely in that direction for Ramstar Games. I want to... uh, We're already working on our second game, even though Honey Bomb hasn't been put out and done yet. We're, We're already looking at the mechanics and working up the second game so that through the winter, I can do all the artwork digitally. So... Instead of working on with an airbrush and paintbrush and then having to make changes physically, we're going to do it all on the iPad, mm-hmm. which, you know, <laughs> you can make changes in heartbeat, right? Right. Uh, it's so much more versatile than trying to do it physically, and I can achieve a very similar result to what I do already. So that is kind of where I'm I'm going now. I'm I'm sort of taking this last year distilled down my experiences to realizing that you know trying to take my creativity into a fine art direction without necessarily say moving and finding the right people or the right group of people to be part of and you know uh, this that and the other thing uh, I can I can take that 
artwork and take what people are telling me in the board game industry and that sort of interest and I can m marry the two together and we can start our own gaming company which is essentially what I'm now throwing my weight behind. Hmm. And how would you describe the game that you're the let's say Honey Bomb like if you were to pitch it to people how do you do how do you present the game to them? Uh, it's you know what uh, we find that everything that we've been seeing online is about being as succinct and as truthful as possible. So essentially it's a tabletop tiling strategy game with a B theme. Okay. That's that's kind of the tagline there and most people want to see that. They want to they want to know exactly what it is. Don't don't give it any flowery language. Just tell me what it is. Mm -hmm. So that's that's it. It's a tabletop strategy game, uh tile laying strategy game with a B theme. And, uh, and before, ultimately before you actually uh said you said board game and then you switched and said you mean tabletop game what is the sure. i saw that you made that distinction what's the difference between the two well essentially i think board games come with a board oh that's, okay that's and this one doesn't come thing, with a know. board no it doesn't okay no, you, gotcha. you create you create the pattern as you as you as you go everything is tiles so you kind of you build as you go along so there's there's technically no board in the game so it shouldn't i don't want to call it a board game i think it would be you want it to be an exciting game, not a board game. Ha, puns. <laughs> um, <Exactly>. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, and then that's how you're building that out. And you're, I, I like that though. I do love the fact that you were ready with it, with the tagline. You're clearly, you know, you've been pitching this. You've been putting it out there. Oh, yeah. I love that. Well, we, we built a whole Kickstarter for it. I would caution anybody who wants to do a Kickstarter to really give yourself a month or two a free time to put it together properly. It's a, it's a beast. Yeah. It's, Kickstarter it's in itself not, is a project. Yeah, it is. It's, it's like a full time. It was a full time gig for me for about a month. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you know, um, my wife, Kitty was, was helping with all kinds of extra bits and pieces and, and helping me out in the background, researching this and looking at that and trying to organize things. And our, our third, who is Sabrina, she was doing all this video editing and stuff. She's got a supercomputer that allows her to do all kinds of slick video editing. She made us a two-minute um, promo video for our Kickstarter, and it looks awesome. It looks great. I can't wait for you know people to actually engage with it and see it. Uh, but that took her several weeks to put together, um, and it's just you know it's a there's all these things to think about inside of Kickstarter. It's it's quite. It's quite an undertaking. Yeah, uh, it doesn't have to be. I mean, if if you're pitching something small and it's quick and it's easy to talk about, fine. You know, if it's um if it's a just a digital file that people are going to be downloading, maybe it doesn't need so much. But for tabletop games, you know, people want to see everything that's in it. They want to see a visual representation of every tier. They want to see gameplay. They want to see video reviews. They want to see all kinds, of, and you've got to, you know, build this long-running list sort of uh, Kickstarter page to try to entice people to, to to pledge with you, right? So yeah, it's uh, it was a lot of effort, but it's there now. It's done. Mm -hmm. So come the spring, a few tweaks, some better numbers, and we'll be ready to fly. And that's just going to be launching the Kickstarter to back it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, uh, one of the things that kind of came up, I guess Kickstarter itself has, has changed quite a bit as it's evolved. So it used to be the sort of platform where you would see things half finished right. and decide to support them or not. And then they would take that capital and finish that thing. Nowadays, it's more like a pre-sale site in that people want to see that thing finished first. So we essentially now need to raise a bit of capital in order to finish Honeybomb, to get in finished test decks in the final box and everything finished, and then ship those out to reviewers so that we can get those video reviews so that people can see what they're going to get. Really? Yeah, there's, is, there's quite a culture that's grown up around it. Uh, and if you go on YouTube and just sort of look at video game reviewers and stuff like that, there's a huge culture all built around people taking those games and reviewing them, not, you know, sort of showing people how to play the games, uh, you know, giving their personal opinions and, and 
That's actually oh, helpful yeah. though, because that means you don't have to spend the time doing it. You can concentrate on the game and making it and getting it out there. And then what next you got to do like the whole tutorials, but having other people do it, that's actually, I, I find that kind of interesting. Huh? Yeah. Well, it's not a bad idea at all. I mean, no. ultimately like some of these people, they've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of subscribers. It doesn't mean hundreds of thousands of people will see their videos, but um, right. you know, it's better than it's, it's very targeted as a as a marketing opportunity it's it's pointed at the at the right people and um it's done by the right people yeah. you know so it's uh yeah so that's sort of our next step is now raising a bit of capital to get finished like we had our our third iteration as i call them honey bomb prototypes that we were sending out and we were hoping that would be enough but it isn't it's um, that was another reason why we decided to postpone our Kickstarter was because we didn't have those reviews. We didn't have people uh, talking to our our client base saying, "Hey, this is the game. This is why you should support it." Okay. So yeah. So what do you plan to do up until that time period? What's what's going to be happening up until when you do the launch? I mean, you said you're going to be focusing more on the game stuff. So while you have this time. What's 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 Sean going to be doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, ultimately, I'm going to be uh, learning everything I can about digital art. Hang on. I'm just going to. Yeah. On. There we go. I know. I was just going to say it's getting to that point. Like our son is going down here, too. So <laughs> <laughs> it'll happen to you in about an hour. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, we're um, at, at the moment for me, it's all about digital. So I'm learning everything I can about the iPad and now that we're sort of really set up with Ramstar Games and we've got the print and play edition of Honey Bomb available and all those sorts of things that we're taking up our time are done, we're going to start working up the next game. We're going to, um, through the winter, that's going to be my big project is doing all the artwork. It's going to be a lot more involved than Honey Bomb was. So Honey Bomb has 14 illustrations. Mm -hmm. The game that we're thinking of doing is probably going to have somewhere around 80 to 100 Okay. So it's going to be quite a bit more robust. Wow. So I need to get good at doing digital so that it doesn't take me a year to do all the artwork. And I'm yeah, hoping you do. Through, through the winter, it will be pretty much finished by the end of the winter. Um, and that way, what I'm trying to achieve with Ramstar Games is to have rolling Kickstarters, at least for now, at least while we're getting That's smart. Started assembled or, or um, sort of set up. So in March or April, we'll kickstart Honey Bomb and then come October, November, we'll have the next one ready to go too. And then by the time that one's kickstarting, we will have the third game organized, at least by mechanics, so that we can start doing the artwork for it. And then come March, April of the next year, we'll launch that one. Yeah. So that's kind of my goal. I'm trying to do two projects at once. So one in its final phase and one sort of in its first or second phase kind of building up in these two projects running together at the same time. I like that. And I love the, I love the way that it's all transitioned, even though it's still, you're technically doing the same thing you were. It's just, yeah, yeah the main focus. I love that. I, I, I'm yeah. glad that we got to talk about that today. That's really cool. Absolutely. And is there, is there anything else um, like where should people go to check out this stuff? Where would you like to send people to see what you're doing? Like, what should people do now that now that we've talked about all this? <laughs> well, ultimately, if anybody really wants to see what we're up to, go to ramstargames.com. That's our main website. You can learn all about me, uh, my wife, Kitty, and Sabrina, our third in the Ramstar team. Um, you can see all of our links are there. If you want to find my website, which is redfracture.com, which is my, my fine art website, you can find that there too. And uh, all of my wife's writing and Sabrina's other creative e efforts, we're all makers and we're all sort of creative in a different way, uh, which makes us a great team. I am sort of the art side of things. Sabrina's the maker side of things. Kitty's the, the author and the writer side of things. And all of our, you know, we're all interested in board games. So we understand the mechanics and we all have different sort of personalities around it. So we're, we make a pretty good team. Uh, which is nice. And you can learn all about it in, in those, those at ramstargames.com, essentially. How, how did you come up with the name Ramstar Games? Oh, uh, we're all Aries, all three of us. Oh, <laughs> and <laughs> I get it. Essentially, we wanted to riff off of that somehow. And I think 
I think we did things like triple Aries games or tri Aries games uh, and uh, different things. And no, Ramstar, like I, when you first said Ramstar, when you first mentioned it while we were talking, I was thinking like, do I know that game company? Like, it sounds like an already established game. Not that you're not, but, <laughs> but it are. sounds like something where it's like, and they produce the new Star Wars game. You know, that's it. Well, there there are other companies called Ramstar, uh, and oh, there, there are. is actually oh yeah yeah Ramstar is uh, you know it's it sounds like something that we came up with, but other people have beaten us to Ramstar as you know it's Ramstar consultants, Ramstar architects, Ram, you know, okay. and there's people all around the world who who are using it as a title, and there is technically a Ramstar Games Group in America. Oh. Well, but, then I wasn't wrong. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But because we're in Ontario and in Canada, we can use the name .ca. Ourselves. So, yeah. <laughs> we're okay. Okay. Well, that's so. pretty cool. All right. Good yeah. to know. So if I ever, if I ever, act, oh no, I was going to say if I ever actually wanted to get the website TomRay.com, I could go to Canada, but it's like, no, it's still, <laughs> that's not how that part works. No. No, no you can't. Well, that, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so somebody else has TomRay.com? There was a uh, funny story about that. Uh, so TomRay.com is uh, technically Tom Ray is an animator who used to work for uh, Hanna-Barbera and Warner Brothers. Like if you look at the, like say the Super Friends from the 70s, if you look at the animators, one of the names is Tom Ray. And right. he, he worked with like Chuck Jones and all that. So he had the website TomRay.com. Like he made the website or someone made it for him in like 1996 and that's that was it. It was never touched again. It was always the same website, like up until. But then he passed recently, or not recently. He passed like maybe I want to say in like 2015, maybe. I'm just guessing off the top of my head. Um, and I was just like, oh, maybe I could get the website. And then I didn't think about it. Then this is the funny part of it. His wife actually reached out to me and asked me if I want. She saw that my name was on Facebook and that I was making cartoons as well, and asked me if I wanted to. Uh, get the website name, the domain name. She asked me like maybe a year after that. And uh, Facebook didn't give me the message because it thought it was somebody trying to contact me, wasn't on my list, put it in. Uh, there's a, Or there was actually a spam messages thing on Facebook. Oh. And I went through years later and saw that she had sent it to me. And I'm like, that was like four years ago she sent me that. And by the time, by then she had already, uh, it's being auctioned for like $1,200 or something like that. Like that's, you know, now it's like unattainable. She doesn't have the rights to it anymore. It ran out. So I can't get it. So that's, that's my story about my website, but you know, whatever. (laughs) <laughs> that's fair that's fair maybe it'll come back around you never know exactly it's i let's let's put it this way i do check it quite often to make sure that it's still <laughs> to see if it's available for cheaper yeah. like at least once once every couple of months anyway um aside from that thank you so much for coming and talking to me today <laughs> i'm no so worries. glad that we got to hook up again it was great it's fun talking to someone that i met before because then we can get right down to it yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's going to be an interesting journey. I'm curious to see where things go, you know, sort of uh, taking this year's experiences and sort of distilling them down into a new avenue of attack. Um, I, I feel very good about it. To be honest with you, I'm really happy with the with the decision and uh, the, you know, changing, changing that direction. It doesn't feel wrong. Mm-hmm. It feels like the right decision to make. And I'm loving the whole digital side of things and where it's going to take us. So. Yeah. No, you, you know, seem like you're really into it. And I think that's a big part of it. And it, it, you're very excited. I mean, the fact that you're already planning on another thing is super cool. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So you got to have got to have irons in the fire. Exactly. Yeah, All right. Yeah. And that uh, thank cool. you so much. And then, thank you, Tom. 